Hello everybody, my name is Paul Arsenal. I'm one of the engineers at Dynacom. In fact, I'm the chief engineer at Dynacom. Today we're gonna to go over the X-Pod and 3500 pod training. It's basic training. Um, I know many of you can't come to Dynacom at the moment due to this COVID uh, pandemic. So we're doing a live training or a video training so everybody can see this later on. So today we're gonna to go over a few PowerPoint slides um, to discuss the software, you know, a little bit about hub dynos and dynos in general, um, a little bit about the physics and math behind them, run types, a little bit about the electronics, and then we're gonna go downstairs um, near the dyno training room um, and do some live dyno runs to show the repeatability and operation of a uh, 2020 Mustang on a hub dyno. All right, first of all, what is a dynometer? Well, a dynometer obviously measures horsepower and torque. Primarily, they measure torque first. From torque, they compute horsepower. Um, there's nothing new about dynometers. We've had them since the late 1800s. Um, what the advantage of having a dynometer today, obviously it provides a safe environment for the operator um, and the user. Of course, today we can't just take out a 1,000 horsepower car and go blasting on the, on the roads um, to tune it and uh, dial the car in. Um, a, it's against the law and, and it, there's plenty of safety implications there. Um, but bottom line, a dyno is just a tool. And uh, you know, part of these slides focus a bit on the chassis dyno and the physics to do it with that, but the same theory applies with the hub dyno. And most of these slides I'm gonna blast through. We do have the PowerPoint presentation available for download, so you can look at them at any time you choose. Um, but I'm gonna go through the basic, a few basic key points. Well, why training? Well, obviously I want to eliminate the confusion that's out there today. Um, the most important thing I would like to mention about chassis dynos and hub dynos in general is there is no standard with any governing body, such as the SAE. I'm Being an engineer, I've been a member of the SAE for about seven years now. That's a Society of Automotive Engineers in North America. Um, there's other societies across the world. There's DIN, which is a German engineering body. Um, there's the JIS, which is a Japanese engin uh, engineering or institute uh, engineering body. And there's the European Union has some engineering bodies. Um, that said, there are standards for engine dynos. Engine dynos and chassis dynos operate in a different way. Um, when you look, well, they don't have the publication anymore, but Car and Driver and Road and Track, at the back of the magazine, they used to publish horsepower figures for cars. And it would always say BHP, which means brake horsepower. Brake horsepower is actually a steady state horsepower figure where the engine is held at a constant load, speed, or value, and there are the horsepower is recorded. Chassis dynos and hub dynos don't operate in that way um, for many reasons, and I'm not gonna share all those reasons today, but essentially, it, it, the cooling, the environment to operate the vehicle, and perform the same kind of test as the engine dyno would take multiple minutes of operation and the vehicle would essentially overheat. In the engine dyno, they have cooling available, um, everything's set up for it. Um, so usually people do a quick ramp or a, a sweep type test where they start the run at low, horse, uh, low RPM, I should say, and go to maximum RPM, which only lasts anywhere from three to 12 seconds long. Um, so the key point I want to make in this slide is there is no standards for chassis dyno and hub dynos to, available today. So there's many different run types. So I'm going to, throughout this presentation, highlight the three most important run types that are, should be used for hub dynos. Uh, this slide is just pointing out the one fact that in the early 1970s, actually in 1970, the SAE changed how horsepower was actually rated or, or measured. I'm gonna go quickly through this slide to illustrate that hub dynos and chassis dynos do not measure torque at the engine per se, they measure it at the axle or the wheel. Um, so the quick example, I'm gonna present a vehicle that has 500 horsepower and 400 foot-pounds of torque peak. Uh, has gear ratios of 3 to 1, 2.25 to 1, 1 1.5, 1 to 1, and the final gear ratio, which is the rear end, was 4 to 1. 
if you take out the, the, four, the peak torque at 400 foot-pounds and you multiply it by the gear ratios in first gear and the final gear ratio, you'll essentially see that the vehicle is putting peak torque down in first gear of 4,800 foot-pounds. As you go through the gears in fourth gear, it's putting down 1,600 foot-pounds. So that's a lot of torque. Um, essentially, that is what the dyno is measuring first. It measures the torque at the axle, or in the case of a chassis dyno, at the roller. And from that information, it works back to calculate what the torque is at the engine, at the flywheel, I should say. These are just the equations, the two equations that are used, the basic equations of how this is done. One part of the torque is due to inertia acceleration. Obviously, the hub dyno and the eddy brakes inside have some kind of mass. In the case of a chassis dyno, the roll has a mass. That mass in rotation, in the angular rotation, is essentially called inertia. So if we take that inertia and multiply it by the angular acceleration, we get a, something called the torque due to acceleration. The second component is the torque due to the eddy brake, which is the, the power absorption unit that is holding back the roll, or in this case, the hub dyno or the axle. We add those two components together and we get the torque at the roll or the torque at the axle. Once we have the torque at the, at the roll or axle, and we know something called the RPM ratio, which is effectively the RPM of the roll divided by the RPM of the engine. That ratio we can enter. There's a pickup type in our software, in quantum software, called gear, the gear ratio or the gear pickup. Um, that pickup essentially just lets the user define the RPM roll of the RPM of the engine. And it's basically the ratio between how fast the axle is moving compared to the flywheel. Essentially the wheel speed compared to the flywheel. And it is only accurate assuming you're locked into one gear. Um, so if you take that ratio and multiply by the torque at the axle or the roll, you'll get engine torque. One thing about the dyno, obviously the hub dyno, the advantage of the hub dyno is you don't have any traction limitations. On a chassis dyno at higher horsepower levels, of course, you can get wheel spin. Um, that said, on both the dynos, when you're running an automatic, and if you're using gear ratio as the pickup, um, or any other ratio for that matter, it's important that if you're running an automatic transmission to try to be locked in to one gear and have the torque converter locked in fully locked up. In other words, somewhere after 2,500 um, RPM in most cases, but for a high stall, that could be 4,000 RPM or higher. Repeatability and accuracy on any dyno consists of these four factors, environment, vehicle, operator, and the sensors of the dyno. In most cases, you know, I think everybody watching this can conclude which is the most... Uh, air prone. It's actually us, the operator. We make mistakes, the setup, etc. Um, the environment, that's the humidity, pressure, and temperature. That doesn't change that much, so that's fairly constant. Of course, the vehicle can have issues. If it's a supercharged vehicle such as a GT500 Ford Mustang, it can get very hot after a few runs. And uh, actually, the engineers at Ford, once the t intake air temperature goes up, they will actually retard timing, and your horsepower numbers will drop dramatically. It has nothing to do with the operator, nothing to do with the vehicle, except that the engineers at Ford program the ECU to drop the timing due to intake air temperature. It's essentially to protect the vehicle. So it's important as a dyno operator to understand the limitations of the vehicle and understand the vehicle thoroughly when dynoing it. Safety guidelines on hub dynos, there are a few. Um, always check the vehicle condition before any dyno session. If it's an older vehicle um, or a newer vehicle, make sure everything in the engine bay and the drive line is all intact with no loose bolts or, or fasteners. Um, if it's a very high horsepower vehicle and has a light front end, when I mean high horsepower, I mean usually 2,500 horsepower and up, you may want to hold down the front with tie-down straps just to prevent any kind of lifting on the front end. Always route the cables away from EMI or RF 
generating sources. And case in point, never have the DB25 cables running from the DC controller to the hubs anywhere near uh, a waste gate or a, waste, a discharge, turbo discharge. You don't want to burn the cables. Um, the one thing that's very, you know, everybody thinks the hub dynos are way safer than chassis dynos. Well, that's a myth. They're safer in the sense that wheels and tires, well, tires don't blow up. Um, and tires hardly ever blow up on chassis dynos, but it does happen. What does happen on a pod series dynos or a hub dyno is drive shafts typically and can and will fail. When they fail, they blow up and they usually exit towards the side of the vehicle. So never stand directly to the side of the vehicle or behind the vehicle or the dyno. If you're a bystander and you're watching, always watch, you know, in the front of the vehicle or far distance, at least 60 feet away. Um, obviously, the operator will be in the car. Um, one key point that I do, if it's a vehicle that I don't know, I usually take a quarter inch piece of uh, steel and I put it down on the floorboards. I don't want a drive shaft to come through the floorboards and cut my, uh, my foot off. One important thing that I do recommend is always ground the vehicle using jumper cables. The reason why you need to ground the vehicle is obviously the ignition system has no place to go except the chassis uh, of the vehicle. Well, when you're an operator and you're holding up this handheld in the vehicle, that high voltage goes through you. It needs to find a path to ground. So it sometimes goes through your hand, your body, and down to this ground you know, the DB9 cable to ground. It finds a path to ground. The issue with that is it gets on the USB communication cable and can cause software crashes or communication problems. So always ground the vehicle. Take uh, jumper cables, jumper uh, one end to the chassis of the vehicle and the other end to some earth point. Um, and it will, trust me, it will save a lot of grief in tracking down issues later on. There's two modes of operation on all our products here. One's called mode one of operation. That's using the dyno without the software. The other one's called mode two. Mode one operation is essentially taking the handheld and operating the dyno with just the handheld and not using the computer whatsoever. Um, what mode one is good for is diagnostic, basic tuning, um, setting up PIDs uh, um, and viewing PIDs and changing timing at any uh, engine RPM or stepping through a constant uh, speed test. Um, and I'll, I'll kind of go through some of this. The handheld, when you turn the box on and off, I'll flip it on and off, comes up. And it will show the speed. In this case, it's in uh, US Imperial units. It will show zero, zero, zero. Um, to turn air fuel on, by the way, you simply hit the plus sign and the air fuel will first show lambda and if I hit the plus sign again it will show the air fuel ratio and as you can see on the front of the controller it turns an LED on depicting that the port is active that's how you turn air fuel on to shut it off you hit the negative sign you can step through some of these screens by hitting the up and down arrows and again you can play with this uh, and look at all the screens on your own time but there's about 20 screens in total, um, and there's also some setup screens. The stop button has essentially no effect on a hub dyno because you don't have brakes. You do have any brakes, but you don't have dynamic brakes such as uh, air brakes like the chassis dynos do. The go button is used for to start and stop a run in mode 2. So in mode 1, it has no effect. Um, one thing about this I'd like to show you is what happens when I hit the setup button on the handheld. If I hit the setup button, there's a lot of screens. Pickup ratio, you know, units, you know, the torque arm length, a whole bunch of stuff that essentially you don't need to know. It's all pre-set up for you and there should be no reason to hit the setup button and modify anything. That said, there's only one perhaps reason that you may want to do it. By default, We've shipped a lot of controllers out, and there is one screen called 
and it's only in version 6.7 firmware called the VRS PID on by default it's enabled um, so that screen again it's version 6.7 and, and higher it's it's near one of the last screens for, by hitting the setup button on the handheld it says VRS PID on I recommend that always be enabled um, if it's disabled it essentially looks at a lookup table in the firmware and not the load cell um, the only reason I point that out there have been units that have been shipped that by default that's disabled um, you know that's essentially a rundown of the controller and, and the handheld now what mode one of operation what it allows you to do if you get in the vehicle you can go to this one screen call, which I call the PAU percent screen the PAU screen for manual load if you come here you can see how it says PAU percent equals zero and minus two pounds um, I essentially have a load cell on the table here which is actually built in the hub dynos of course on a 3500 series there's two one for the driver's side one for the passenger side for the x-pod there's only one if i put some weight on this load cell you can see that the my the pounds go up that essentially measures the force um, whenever you turn the box on and off and you go to this screen you want to make sure that it hovers between you know plus or minus five pounds there is a way to zero it out, such as on the way scale, like a tear button. When you're on this screen, all you got to do is hit the dot button. So if I'm on this screen, and let's just say I'm going to put some force on this load cell, fake force here. I'll put 30 pounds. And I hit the dot button, and I wait a few seconds. It will automatically tear that out. Now it's back to negative one. If I put my hand off the load cell... It's now wrong, right? It's negative 40 pounds. So again, to zero out the, or re-tear, or auto-zero the dyno in mode one, I just go to the PAU percent screen, hit the dot button, and in a few seconds, it will set that load cell to plus or minus five pounds, and it's hovering at negative two pounds, which is great considering this is set up as a 3,000 pound load cell. So it's well within the tolerance of... Uh, of where it needs to be um, there's another uh, screen on this handheld called the PID mode I can go to PID mode and I can change that to speed and I can enter a target of say 50 miles per hour and then hit OK now when I'm in the vehicle and if I start lo slowly putting the acceleration well when I get to 50 miles per hour guess what the, the hub dyno will hold the vehicle at 50 miles per, per hour um, now that said in first gear it's possible to over, uh, overpower the eddy brakes because the hub dyno, as shown on the previous slides, holds back torque. So in first gear, the vehicle has a lot more torque at the axle than it does in higher gear. So I suggest when you do this to be in a high gear, such as a one-to-one -one ratio. There's other types of tests in this PID mode. Again, that was holding a constant speed. I can change that to holding constant force to do a ramp test or a PAUSL, or I could just do a VRS right from the handheld. A lot of these things are discussed more in advanced topics. Today we're just going over basic operations, so there's other slides and videos. If you're interested in seeing more about Mode 1 of operation, look for the Mode 1 operation manual online. So I'm just going to change back to a regular screen now, the default screen and go discuss mode two all right all right mode two of operation is essentially what most people are going to be using it's where you inter interface with the computer and the hardware and the electronics to do dyno runs and dyno pulse um, essentially the only the buttons when you create the software you first need to create a session that looks like a folder with a little plus sign you need to create a session before you create a run. Um, after you create a session, then you start a run. So now we're going to go into mode two of operation. That's essentially when, and most people are going to do this, is interact with the computer, the electronics, and the dyno to do actual dyno pulls. So 90 to 99% of all users are going to use this on a common, common daily thing if they're dynoing vehicles every day. Well, when you open up Quantum, which is a dynocom software, 
you first have to create a session by hitting the folder with the little green plus sign. Once you create a session, you enter in some information, which I'll show you shortly, then you can create a run. Now there's various number of run types that you can have the option of choosing. The three run types that are kind of used specifically for a hub and axle dynos or our pods are the roll-on, the PAU ramp, and the VRS. The VRS is a new test that is now introduced in the hub and our pod line, and it's out of beta. It's kind of the de facto standard test that I would slowly start recommending everybody to use or at least look at. Um, we're also the only ones to actually have VRS on a hub dyno. And the advantage of VRS, I'll illustrate later on in the slides. Um, again, now that we're in mode two, the plus sign on the hand, handheld becomes the key to start and stop the dyno run. And I'm going over PowerPoint slides right now. After the PowerPoint slides, we'll bring up Quantum, illustrate how the software and the handheld interact. But later on, after the presentation of the PowerPoint slides, we're going to go downstairs in the dyno room, as I said earlier, and perform some live dyno runs showing the three basic types of run types that I briefly mentioned earlier. This is just another graph showing the graph, what the graph looks like in the, in, on the software. Um, one thing about dyno run basics, I try to tell people to always perform runs in one-to-one -one gear ratio. The advantage of that is obviously reduced torque at the axle or, or the rear wheels. Obviously, if you're in a gear ratio like first gear, which could be 3.35 to 1, you're going to have a lot more torque at the axle, which is going to be harder on the dyno, harder on the eddy brakes or the power absorption units, and make the run blast by much quicker. So perform in one-to-one -one if you can. That said, yeah, one to one gear ratio of a 2020 Mustang with the 10 speed is seventh gear. I did, will do a few runs in seventh gear. However, I reached the, the maximum speed limit, which is on the vehicle, which I believe it's 152 miles per hour. I could be wrong, but I end up hitting the speed limit of the vehicle because it's a stock Mustang. So I'm going to roll back and do it in fifth gear for the test later on today. Um, one thing to do is make sure you have adequate ventilation and cooling on the vehicle. That does affect, obviously, the repeatability. Um, snapshot and optical is best. Inductive is, is hit or miss. Our new RPMI box with the inductive, you can set up. But if you don't ground the vehicle, you will have issues with the inductive. Um, I literally use gear ratio for every run that I do on the hub dynos and the, our pods. Um, they're just easier to use, and again, from downstairs, when we go downstairs to do the live t runs with this Mustang, you'll see I'll only use gear ratio. Um, there is videos, again, available online um, through our Facebook forum that will show how to hook up an optical and an inductive, if that's what you wish to do. Again, always ground the vehicle to earth first. It will eliminate a lot of problems. Um, a lot of people confuse computer errors or computer software crashing with other things. Um, again, when we go downstairs, we'll do at least 10 or 15 runs. Again, there are several different run types. We're going to go through th over three of them later on um, with this 2020 Mustang. The most common run type for pods are roll-on and ramp. Uh, the VRS, again, in showing a question mark there, is a new run type that has been available for about eight months. Um, it's actually been available much longer than that for our chassis dynos, and it's been part of the software. It's just been in alpha mode and not uh, uh, a run type recommended up until now. We've dialed it in, and the VRS will slowly and should become our standard run type. Now, a lot of people use ramp because they're familiar with ramp. I will talk about the various run types a little later on in the PowerPoint slides. One rule of thumb, if you're using a roll-on with static load, is 10% load per 300 to 350 horsepower. I also have up here interpolate over speed. Um, that's more stable than using engine RPM or interpolating over RPM. It's also quicker. Um, all right, I'm going to discuss a little bit about vehicle dynamics here because that effectively 
will allow the operator to choose which run type best works for them. Um, if this is a vehicle, and I don't know where what kind of vehicle this is, but this is typically how a vehicle's acceleration and velocity changes from a standstill to high gear. This vehicle has fifth, fifth gear, uh, fifth gear as you can see, but usually when it starts from a zero standstill, the acceleration is quite steep. Um, that's depicted by a straight line or the slope of the curve. And the curve never is a straight line, but the, P, the ramp test uh, is, is essentially holding a vehicle at a constant acceleration rate. That said, vehicles never accelerate at a constant acceleration rate. So in first gear, you can see the vehicle accelerates, and then in second gear, it's accelerating at a different rate, third gear a different rate, fourth gear a different rate, fifth gear a different rate. In other words, the slope of each one of these curves is different. In high gear, the acceleration is much, much less than obviously first gear. So a vehicle with you know, multiple gears, if you do the ramp test, it would be very recommended to only do it in one gear and a gear at best that has the, the, the most constant acceleration rate. As you can see, if you look at these graphs, they're all curved. So possibly in this case, either third gear or fifth gear has the most constant acceleration rate. And then what that rate is would be the slope of the curve. Um, in most cases, I'll give you an example of common rates. For a Mustang GT at 2019, 2020, they commonly accelerate in fifth gear at around 15 miles per hour per second. Hence, I will do the, in fifth gear at 15 miles per hour per second when I use the ramp test. Um, now let's look at fast, very fast cars or other cars. So this graph depicts in the acceleration of many different vehicles. Of course, a Volkswagen Bug is a very slow vehicle, so its acceleration rate is way down, you know, one to two meters per second squared. However, as the vehicle accelerates, that acceleration will change. So from a standstill, the acceleration is very quick, but it drops considerably. Um, and that's usually the dynamics of a vehicle when they're in multiple gears. For a high horsepower vehicle, such as a Pro Mod, usually they only have two or three gears, a first and a second speed. And if we did a dyno run even at second speed, the acceleration rate is nowhere constant. Um, hence, VRS or a roll-on interpolated is much more of a better run type to use for very high horsepower cars. Um, it depicts what's actually happening in the real world. So again, from briefly going over the vehicle dynamics that I just showed you, you'll say which run types to use. Well, there are no standards of what run type to use for any chassis or hub dyno or pod or axle dyno in the world today. I recommend to use the run type that works for you. If you're used to ramp tests, use a PAU ramp type. If you want to simulate the vehicle more in real world, use the roll on it with interpolated load and you can customize those interpolated values um, on your own or use the standard drop box which you'll see a little later on. Um, now if you use the VRS, you don't, the, the guesswork, there is no guesswork. You select the vehicle based on what's in the EPA database or the based on the mass rolling the coefficient of drag of the vehicle and uh, the, the rolling tire friction. I understand the hub dyno doesn't have tires, but you have to enter that in to uh, properly simulate how the vehicle performs in real world on the track. Um, or you can simply use a roll on with static load. And I'll go through the three tests later on. But s simply saying for any vehicle under a thousand horsepower, and if you're using it in one specific year, a ramp test is w fine and well suited. But to more correctly mimic how the vehicle is actually operating, I suggest using the VRS. Um, if you're really an expert user, the roll-on with interpolated um, is another common run type that I recommend. I go through this all the time. Follow good grounding practice. I make sure your AC cables, uh, the power cables plugged in the pods are grounded to, to the building and very good grounds. Um, either gauge 8 or gauge 10. 
to the building and to the pods. Um, and ground vehicle to the frame and to the earth, always. It eliminates a lot of problems. I say it again and again. Do I always do it? No. Should I always do it? Yes, and I recommend doing it. Um, route wires away. Uh, obviously, if you're using an inductive pickup or optical pickup, don't run it over the alternator or right over a bunch of uh, coils. Try to route them away from electrical systems. Um, nearby TIG welding can hamper the performance of the dyno and cause some issues because the high frequencies get on the the power planes. Now, one thing I highly recommend, and you can buy these from us or you can get it from PowerVar directly, is a PowerVar 61048ABC402-11. That's this device here. It's an isolation transformer, and it stops any noise from the power. And there are a lot of power surges when you're using the dyno because of the two eddy brakes, and the, at least two eddy brakes. If you're using tripods, I know this is the XPod 3500 pod training, but with the pods that have even more eddy brakes, there's a lot of noise and transients going across uh, in the building. So this isolation transformer helps isolate the USB bus from the PC to the DC controller. So I highly recommend one of these. If you don't use one of these, just try to use the recommended cables. And uh, if you are using a laptop, simply take the power cable of the laptop, like I'm doing on this laptop, and unplug it and run on battery power. Um, and th that should be suffice. Now, very few, now again, I have on the bottom here, not all computers are created equally. I, I get this more than once a month. We've tried on five different computers. Well, that said, it's probably something else. And it could be you're not grounding the vehicle or a loose ground cable somewhere in your cable coming to the units themselves. Um, could be a lot of things. If there are, you do have some issues, you know, feel free to contact Dynacom Tech Support and we can assist you. Most common questions, how to turn on the air, air fuel. Well, I kind of went over this a little bit in mode one operation. You pick up the handheld on the base screen and hit the plus sign. That The first plus will be lambda, second plus air fuel. How to lock axes to cross the 52, 52 RPM in SA units. Well, in the software, you go to view, graph format, enable lock axes. Um, Horsepower is correct, but torque is too high. Again, torque is calculated at the axle or the chassis and then back calculated to figure out what it is at the flywheel. The, I talk about this all the time about the RPM ratio or RPM to speed ratio. You can edit that after a run. And when we go downstairs and do some runs, at one point I will show you how to do this um, to edit the RPM ratio. And what it does, it effectively changes the torque of the flywheel. However, the torque at the rear wheels or at the axle and the horsepower does not change. It has nothing to do with that. Um, if you go through the slides that we've already kind of quickly presented, you'll see if you look at the equations, it has no bearing. Again, this is more, more most common Q&A. Everything on this, you can download the PowerPoint slides. I'm not going to spend a great deal going over this. All right, now let's go and bring up the software. One thing about the software, before I bring it up, every user has a key. Looks like this. What's on the key is all the parameters to your system, the inertia, the type of eddy brake it is, and the type model. Everything to you is with this key. If you lose this key, the dyno is interoperable. You'll have to purchase another one. So make sure this key is always plugged into the PC before when you're about to start quantum. It has to be in the computer before you start quantum. So I'm just going to plug it in. Now I say yes, and the software will come up. You'll notice on the bottom right-hand corner of the software, there's a lightning bolt. That lightning bolt means you're communicating with the DC controller. If you're not communicating and there's no lightning bolt, the most common issue is the USB cable is not plugged in or you didn't install the device driver. That's the first thing you want to do when you um, set everything up. And how do you know how to install the device driver? Well, simply click Help in the software, and there's a section here, Installing the device driver. Click Installing the dri device driver and follow these steps. Um, we recommend using Windows 10. It does operate on Windows 7. We don't recommend Windows 8 and will not support Windows 8 um, PCs. So follow the steps on installing the device driver software. Um, 
it will lead you to the use of the device manager and you'll see a DC controller here. You'll have to install the driver for that. In some cases, and very few, it also comes up as a USB serial port. In other words, you have to install a device driver for two devices, the DC controller and the USB serial port, if this pops up. So once you follow those steps and install the device driver per the instructions, you will see a question or a lightning bolt whenever the DC controller is turned on and off. You'll also see the humidity, pressure, and temperature. I do not have a humidity, pressure, temperature plugged in up here, but downstairs when we're about to do dyno runs, you'll notice that th these numbers will be active. And trust me, today is a very hot day. We'll probably get into the hundreds. But anyways, I'm going to show you the briefly the overview of the software. So the first thing we're going to do is create a session. Um, to create a session, you just come up here, create a session. You can enter a title, anything we'll do. We'll just go, my first dyno, dyno run. Okay, now we select a VIN. I've already done a various number of vehicles in here, so I'm just going to go select 2019 Mustang GT and click any other box, and it fills it in. Now, for our pods or axle dynos, we need you to enter in the tire diameter. Why do you have to enter in tire diameter? That's how we determine the roll speed or the mile per hour speed of the vehicle and the distance it travels. Obviously with different tire diameters, it will go different speeds. So whatever tire you're using or will be using, you enter that. Of this Mustang, it's 26 inches. I go next. The owner, I'll just call it Dynacom. I go finish. After that is done, you'll notice this new run icon is now active, which means you can create a run. I'll go new run. I'm going to start out with a gear roll on. I go next. And I'm going to go do an interpolated run. And I'm going to select the horsepower range. The Mustang we're going to be using is about 480 horsepower, or 460 to 480. So I'm going to hit that range of horsepower right there, uh, predetermined by this. I go next. This shows me an optical. I'm going to select gear ratio, and then I'm going to enter the, uh, a gear ratio number. I'm going to put four. You can always change this after. The, essentially, the gear ratio, if you read all this jargon here or text here, it's the ratio between the engine speed and the wheel speed, defined as engine RPM divided by wheel speed RPM. In most cases, if you're, used in, you're in a one-to-one -one transmission gear, it's going to be the ratio or the, the ratio at the differential. Um, so I do not know. I believe the ratio when I'm in fifth gear and multiplied by the gear ratio of the vehicle we're going to be using, it's around 4.6. So I'll enter 4.6 in there. And then I hit next or finish. And that's it. It's ready to do a run. All I Now I'm not going to be able to do a run here because I... Don't, I'm not hooked up to a dyno, but essentially I get into the gear I'm about to do the run in. In this case, we'll say fifth gear. Get around 2,000 RPM, or that's some point after my torque converter is fully locked up. Press the go button. Once the run is over, I press the go, meaning that I hit red line. I hit the go button again. And that ends the run, and it will come up with a pop-up showing me the max power and torque. So that's using a roll-on. Now let's say I'm in the vehicle, I don't want to get out of the vehicle. Well, if I'm in the vehicle, I don't want to get out, I don't want to come back here and hit the new run button. All I have to do is essentially hit the go button. When I hit the go button, it brings up the gauges for me. And it's ready and it says right on the handheld, press go to start. Now I get into fifth gear again, start around 2000 RPM, hit the go button, pause for about half a second, accelerate to red line, and then hit the go button again to the end to end the dyno run. So essentially, I'm now assuming I'm in fifth gear, around 2,000 RPM or so, maybe 2,500. Press the go button, pause for half a second, accelerate to full throttle, go to red line, hit the go button again, and again the run is finished. Um, that's using a roll-on type run. The other type of runs is a PAU ramp test, which I go PAU ramp down here, select PAU ramp go next. Um, by default, I always want the test channel to be speed. 
For more advanced users or after you're more familiar with speed, you can select engine RPM and do a ramp rate of like 500 RPM per second. But for this basic training, we're going to do speed. Um, I know this Mustang we're going to be able to test accelerates at 15 miles per hour per second roughly. So I enter 15 in. I can enter 14. I can enter 12. But I know it's around 15, so I'm just going to go ahead and put 15 in. Everything else on this screen, I want you to keep checked, like start ramp on run start, use enter deceleration rate, then I go next. Again, I want to use gear ratio because it's so easy to use. I, the gear ratio is 4.6, I go next. Now the difference on a ramp test, it has this checked, temporary hold current speed on run start. What that essentially does is hold the vehicle at the moment I press the go button, in, in the case I will be doing in fifth gear, whatever speed I'm going at in fifth gear, let's say 50 miles per hour and I hit the go button, no matter how much gas I give the vehicle, it's going to hold the vehicle back at around 50 miles per hour, uh, 50 miles per hour, um, give or take 0.1 miles per hour. And it's going to hold it, in this case, for four seconds. At the end of that time, it's going to accelerate the vehicle at a ramp of 15 miles per hour per second all the way to the red line. And then I hit the go button at the end of the run. So essentially, to, to recap, I enter a number here. It's got to be between 1 and 10, ideally. The default is 4. I go finish. And what it's going to do when I hit this go button, um, obviously I can't do it here because I don't have a dyno or a vehicle, but I hit go button. When I hit the go button, I'm going to gradually accelerate my or put my pedal all the way to the floor and I have four seconds to do it. So within four seconds, I want my foot all the way to the floor and I want to hold it there. And it's going to hold the vehicle for four seconds at whatever speed I hit the go button. And then after that four second time, it will accelerate the vehicle at a ramp rate of 15 miles per hour per second. I'm going to cancel this run by hitting the X sign because obviously we can't do a ramp run here. We have no vehicle or no dyno hooked up. The third most common type of run, and the run I would recommend highly everybody should be using on an axle or hub dyno, in our case our pods, is the VRS. So VRS, I simply select Virtual Road Simulation, and I go Next. And by default, if I entered in the correct information, like the year of the vehicle and all that stuff, the make, it's going to have parameters here on use vehicle dynamic coefficients. Uh, if those are available, I, pref I want people to select those by default. If you don't have those parameters available, or if it's a vehicle that's not in the EPA database, you can use the vehicle parameters of the frontal area of the vehicle, which you, know, you can measure. For a Mustang, it's around 28 feet squared. The drag coefficient is about 0 0.34, 0 0.34. Um, the rolling resistance coefficient is to do with the tires, leave the defaults. We're not going to run an incline, so we'll leave that at zero. The mass with the driver is, say, 4,200 pounds or, or probably 4,000 pounds. Um, but if their coefficients are available, always use the default coefficients. All right? Now, here's where it gets tricky. Depending on which firmware version, 6.2 to 6.7, uh, I should say, the VRS correction factor. For 6.7 firmware, it's 2 across the board. So always have a 2 for the VRS correction factor. By default, you can cha adjust the software so it always puts a 2 in there. And I'm just going to cancel this briefly and show you what that is. Test default parameters. I go to VRS. And I make sure that's a 2. If that's a 2, it's going to put a 2 in there. So I'm going to make sure that's a 2. It's A-OK. -okay. Now when I go to new Dyna Run, virtual road simulation, well, it says 1 still. That's because this session's already created. But in essence, I want that to be a 2. Now you can adjust that coefficient, but it's always going to be the same. All right, It should be around 2. So I enter a 2 here, I go next, the gear ratio again, 4.6 is the, my estimated RPM ratio, I go next, I go finish, I press the go button to start the run, pause for half a second, accelerate to red line, hit go button again, and it'll end the run and show me a horsepower torque figure. Obviously we're going to do this later on. 
Um, so let's go through the software and actually look at a previous runs to give you a better idea of what we're talking about. So we're going to look up this. Uh, here's some runs on a pod. These are VRS runs right here. And by the looks of the horsepower, they're d done on one of our Mustangs. This was probably done on a 2019 Mustang. Um, it was a VRS run, and you can see it's 379 and 374 back-to-back. -back. Uh, I don't know what gear it was in, um, but essentially that's what the run data looks like. That's what the horsepower looks like. You can change the axes um, to see d various things. If I click this power and change that axis to acceleration, and then I'm going to change this axis to none, and I'll change that to time or engine speed. Well, as you can see, for a VRS run, when I'm starting acceleration from a stop, what do you notice? You get that kind of basic swoop there. It, is, it accelerates very high, and then it starts dropping down the acceleration rate, right? And, and if you look back, I'm going to bring up my PowerPoint slide really quick. Again, this is a vehicle starting off at a speed. You get that kind of downward or decaying acceleration curve, which is actually what the vehicle does in real life. So going back to our quantum software and zooming in, you can see that decay there. It comes down, and you can kind of see that swoop. In an RPM, in a PAU ramp test, that acceleration will be constant. That's not how a vehicle is actually performed. But anyways, you can play around with the software like this. I'll go back to engine speed now. And you notice here it only really went to 55, to between 55 and 6,000 RPM. Uh, well, I know when I was dynoing the vehicle, and I did this some time ago, I, uh, well, to be exact, almost a month ago, this was done on, <coughs> excuse me, June 19th of this year which was almost a month ago, but not quite. Um, I redlined this car to almost 6,500 RPM. So which means my RPM ratio, it was not set up correctly. I can go over to the run info bar and look what it was. It was four, set to four. So watch what I do if I right click this, go edit run, change that to I know what it should be. It should be around 4.6 or 4.5, 4.6. Now it shows the graph going to 6,500 RPM, which is, which is what I did, almost 7,000. Um, and if I'll select this at torque over here. Now what you notice, when I did that, it did not change the horsepower one bit, but it does change the torque, all right? If I change that second run, you notice it says 384 foot-pounds of torque. If I edit the run and I change that to 4.6, for the run two, go okay. Now that changes the torque to more in line with what it was from run one to 334 compared to 337. Um, now this torque, when it says torque, that represents the torque estimated at the flywheel. I can change this and I can go roll over here and go roll torque. Now that's the torque at the actual axle, which no matter if you change the gear ratio or not, I'm gonna go do it just for giggles. I'll change that to three, boom. You know that nothing happened, right? The torque is still 1551. All it does is change the range of the RPM <clears throat> using gear ratio. So it has, it doesn't affect the horsepower whatsoever. So I'm gonna edit it, go back to 4.6. Now the graphs virtually overlay one another. The torque was 1550 at the axle. I don't want it at the axle because my most of your customers and the end customer wants to see what it is at the flywheel. I'll go change it to torque here, and the graphs pretty much overlay. So again, those were VRS runs. They were done within one minute of one another, and their the horsepower is almost overlays identically. I can right-click this graph and change my smoothing to some value. Ideally, I like to keep it around two or three. You can see the effect when you change it. It smooths out the curve, changes the power a little bit, in that case, drastically. But for hub dynas, you want to keep this between two and three. All right. Anything over three, don't get too caught up on the smoothing. Keep it between two and three and leave it. Um, there's other things on here. If I want to 
look at all the data for the run. I could simply go to the data tab and I could pick whichever run I want and I can see the data for all that run, the roll speed, etc. Um, a little bit about troubleshooting here. I'm going to select run one. If you ever dyno a vehicle and you notice half the horsepower versus what it should be, well, simply do this. Change the axes to speed, roll speed, roll one speed, or primary speed, primary speed, and secondary speed on this axis. That would be secondary, speed two. They should overlay, right? And if you look at the data here, the, the speeds from the left and the right pod, which is dr pastor and driver, should be consistent with one another. If this is all zeros or one of them is all zeros, that means either your cable's not plugged in on the other side or has come loose and your power is obviously going to be wrong. So reconnect the cable, redo the run. Second thing that can happen and will happen eventually is the speed sensor itself may need adjustment inside. Um, and there's documentation to, to how to do that. It happens very infrequently about the adjustment on the pods. The main cause where a speed would drop off is the cable coming unplugged. Um, the other thing is the load cell. Um, I'm going to talk about the load cell a little bit in the software. There's something in the setup. Got setup. If I go to the setup tab and press load, you'll see it says auto zero load cell before run. So ideally, I want that checked off, but I want my tolerance to be around 20 pounds, anywhere between 10 or 20 pounds. In other words, if I go is about to start a run and the load isn't near zero or plus or minus 20 pound range, it will automatically re-zero out or tear out the load cell reading. Kind of what I did, showed you a little bit earlier when I put my weight on the load cell here. Um, so I recommend having auto zero load cell before run, having it at 20 pounds um, and leaving it at that. Now one case in point, if you're about to do a run and we'll do a fake run here by doing new run and virtual road load, go next. In some cases, it will not do it here, but it will pop up with a message saying auto zero load cell. When that's up, do not have the axle or the rear end in motion. It must be at static at rest. Once it's at rest and once that dialogue goes away, that's when you can be begin rolling on the dyno or in this case on the pods. Um, well, that's it for up here. Um, let's head on downstairs, do some dyno runs uh, we're going to do, again, roll-on, ramp, and VRS. And furthermore, if you have any questions at the end of all this, you can either contact Dynacom. Um, there's a toll-free number. I'll read it on my card. It's one 436 dyno Or you can email me directly. My name is Paul underscore Arsenault. That's A-R-S-E-N-E-A-U at Dynacom.net. Or give me a call. Email's best. Again, it's Paul underscore Arsenal. That's A-R-S-E-N-E-A-U at Danacom.net. Thank you and have a good day.